Are you listening? Ooh, it's lovely, isn't it? Now, listen to this. It's just not the same, is it? If you want your audience to pay attention, bring them in with sound. Sound is primal. The open secret is that you see a movie more with your ears than with your eyes. And Peter Albrechtson, who designed the sounds you just heard, knows that. The only sound that you're really using from the shoot is the dialogue. When the characters are listening in a film, then the audience is listening. Go crazy, be creative and have fun. Peter shares a masterful philosophy on how you can use sound to tell your story. Not just for horror films, but for any genre. This video podcast was recorded with Riverside. It is the best remote video recording tool for podcasts. You can find out more about them later. How would you describe the role of the sound designer? Very much as the ears of the director. The original concept of the sound designer, which was created in the 1970s by picture editing and sound editing guru Walter Murch, mm. who uh, invented the term sound design. And the idea was that as a sound designer, you're part of the process already from the script stage mm. through the shoot. And then when you get to post-production, then you work with very closely with the picture editor to develop the, the, the sonic language of the film. So I mm. want to create something where it feels like you can almost touch the sounds in a way. Mm. And wow. um, of course, in a, in a film like Evil Dead Rise, you really don't want to touch those sounds because it's splatty and bloody and horrible and horrendous. But if you can make that visceral and tactile, then it really feels like you're there. We would love for you to break down as to what are the choices that you made to make that work. Hey there, cutie pie. This so is good, one of these moments where we go from something that's very quiet into something that's loud. Notice how Alyssa Sutherland, who's playing the mother, is talking very quietly. And of course, that's a way of kind of making her listen more like the thing is that when you talk this way you talk this way hello how are you then people lean in and of course the daughter leans in because she wants to hear the mother's voice but the audience also leans in and it becomes even more horrendous and scary because okay what's gonna happen like okay if she talks like that okay my god what will happen is that a decision that's made on like the mixing stage or do you like at the very beginning you're like all right this needs this dialogue needs to be quiet so the audience leans in and that's how you're like orienting your mind mm. it's shot in a very special way and that visual style opened up for like being quite crazy with how we mix the sound we are doing all kinds of weird distorted things with the sound that's it come on now do it for mom and dad. So then when we make this moment very quiet, then suddenly people are like, oh my God. So like in just a second, there'll be something that is tearing us apart. And what <laughs> will happen? So in that way, kind of using the dynamics of the sound design to kind of bring the audience even more on the edge is something that uh, we were definitely playing around with in in post. For me, it was like that made this next moment feel so much more impactful for when she then like uh, raises up. And then we would get that really horrific sound as well as she raises up. For all of her movements in the film, there's this classic trick of using a lot of vegetables. Mm -hmm. If you crack a celery, it sounds really like bone crunching. And I wanted this feel of her insides, like her internal organs even, had been moved around by being possessed. So it was like... <laughs> Nothing a big old hug and kiss from you won't fix. 
but then I also wanted a kind of meaty kind of feel. So we got this bone from uh, a cow, actually, like with like having a bit of meat and a beef, like. So then together with the celery, then you got these <laughs> sounds. And then on top of that, to kind of make it feel more unreal. And like, so this is a dead eyed, it's scariest thing you can imagine. Mm. So I thought, okay, how about like manipulating those sounds so that it almost feels like it exists in its own kind of weird time capsule. So some of the sounds are going backwards, some are going forward. Like that sound is a mixture of like, <laughs> like that, but also the same sound played backwards. I don't know, mom. I do. So that ah. you kind of have this feeling of, wow, this is something I recognize, but there's also something in there that is just otherworldly. That is so cool. You're making me squirm just by describing it in this case. <laughs> now you might have noticed how great the video quality is on Peter. Especially when we recorded this, he was all the way in Denmark. And that's because we recorded his video with Riverside. Honestly, if you're not using Riverside for all of your virtual meetings, you're making a big mistake. I've even been using it for consultations. As soon as we're done, I get to send them the entire recording. And not to mention the recording quality is freaking it's good. Whereas other virtual meeting services can only do up to 720, Riverside can do 4 Okay. Which is why we like to use it for podcasting. And we love it because it records each audio and video track separately so that editing is such a breeze when we get into post. Which means our editor can get started on cutting it almost immediately. And even if you or your guest has absolute garbage internet, it doesn't matter. Because remember that one time when we were in the hotel room? I mean, the call kept on jostling. I thought we lost it, but because Riverside records locally and then uploads, the call was perfect. And it's easy for the guests. They don't need to install anything. You just send them the link and you can start recording. It even says like, roll out the red carpet. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yeah, it makes it, me feel special. It makes me feel so special. If you're podcasting, creating video content or recording online calls, then sign up to riverside.fm for free and use code editing podcast for 20% off. And you can find that link in the description and we'll see you back in the interview. With that, I'm also interested in the demonic uh, voice of the mother and how that was progressing and changing. And like this, I really, really loved how this progressed. Nothing a big old hug and kiss from you won't fix. Open up now, like a good girl. I'm so uncomfortable because it's so quiet, but like in a good way. And then That's it's going, it. Yeah. Come on now. Oh, I, I heard one of those bone cracks. Here. Do it for mom and dad. That, yeah. Do it for mom and dad. That part, that part freaked me out. Yeah. Tell me how you did that. <laughs> <laughs> the evil laugh. <laughs> exactly. What you're hearing uh, at the end of this is Elisa's own voice, but then we took one of these takes that were little weirdly spoken, and then I think we pitched it down just slightly but only a little bit uh, so that you get this feeling of like, oh, this is, it, it's her saying it, but you can tell that something is really off and wrong. And then the more that her character develops into becoming a real demon, the more we did crazy boys treatments. And we did what I actually did for some of the more demonic places. Like for a few months, we went to the local zoo here in Copenhagen and recorded all kinds of animals. Like they called us every time that there was an animal that was in a, like doing something special, like, okay, so now the giraffe is going to have a baby or now the rhino will go out, like swim for the first time in a few weeks. So we went out there and recorded all these, this, Especially there's, there was this Tasmanian devil who like had all these crazy sounds. But then it also felt like, okay, it got a little weird, a little too kind of animal-like. So what we did was we also brought in this amazing singer, Jenny Rosander is her name. So then I got Jenny to do these animal voices, replicate them with her own voice, because she can do things like that. <laughs> It was this 
special process where we were developing her voice all the time. That's crazy. What you're saying is we didn't really process it that much. We actually just had a singer, had a, a vocalist, like, make weird sounds. And that's how we did it. And that sounds like a lot more real and a little bit more scary, actually, than making it seem processed. It was uh, it was something that was very important to Lee Cronin, the director, that he really wanted it to feel very organic. That And it's also, it goes back to the old Evil Dead movies where... You can tell that it's done in a very kind of human voices, but they're just being treated in a way where you can still feel that it's human. <laughs> For me, at least, it makes it feel more scary because mm. you can kind of tell that this is a this is a human being, but a human being that's been turned inside out. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, Lee Cronin is very much about making every sound count. So it's a really interesting way of approaching sound design. So instead of having like 50 sounds playing on top of each other, like constantly like this carpet of sound, every little sound moment has its special character. For the screen, that is the moment where like everything in at that moment for Lee, he was saying, distort everything, trying to distort every, every sound on the soundtrack. It's just two, three seconds, but it's so loud. It's so shocking. It's really like, it's so visceral because distortion has this, like, if, if something distorts in your ear, it's because it's doing something very violent to you. This feeling like, Oh my God, everything is falling apart. Like, shh. It's not just a loud scream, it's distortion. It feels mm. like everything is falling apart. And it's such a great way of using sound in a psychological way and a physical way at the same time. The way that you're using distors distortion psychologically mm. is absolutely like mind blowing to me because you can just make something loud and lots of times when, at least when you're mixing you're on the stage you're like yeah that's cool it's loud but it doesn't feel like there's something going on you know it doesn't have that quality where it's like i don't actually feel threatened even if it's just loud so there's, there's like more than volume that really affects the human mind let's take a quick look through this scene and talk through this one as well i do there's his clicks again. Exactly. And it creates this feeling of, okay, there's something really wrong with that body of hers. Like, you can just, you can tell that all the bones are crackling. Let me kiss it better. Ah, I regret watching this. <laughs> well, I regret listening to it, but in a good way. I remember when mixing this film, I thought to myself, okay, we really have to think about like every moment that we can have quietness in this film, we need it. Because there's so many moments which are really loud, really noisy, really in your face. I mean, it's incredibly important to be dynamic because otherwise people can't, I mean, you can't stand just getting hit over the head all the time. You need mm -hmm. kind of like, you need also need to get drawn into the film. And then suddenly she jumps and it's like, we make that very loud. <laughs> and that's again, music and sound brought together to kind of create mm -hmm. that jump, jump scare. I mean, it's I actually a, literally a jump scare. <laughs> it's literally a jump scare. <laughs> it's literally a jump scare. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. We need to have a serious conversation. I need you to stop spending your entire day looking for music that actually isn't even that good. But Track Club is actually full of bloody great music. Their entire library is banger after banger and mash. We also know that audio is essential for creating an emotional world for your audience. This is why beyond having great music, Track Club has Mixlab, which allows you to use stems to customize it to your situation. For example, there's this documentary song that I really liked that sounded hopeful. But if I soloed the vocals, that sounded scary. Or I just used the mallets to create a build. 
And Track Club makes it super simple to avoid copyright strikes. Paste your channel's URL into Track Club and Bob's your uncle, your videos will be cleared automatically. My uncle's name's Dave. Guess what? They're offering your first month for free. So go to the link in the description and get your free month of Track Club today. We were taught this when we first started doing editing. It's like, you gotta make the editing invisible. You gotta, we, gotta, we gotta make sure we're not aware of the sound design. This scene, for me, completely says, fuck that. And I feel every cut. And I, and I, and I feel that, I think, because of every time, that, because of just the way that you use the drill. Like, how did you even make the drill escalate and made me hyper-focus on that? It's constantly evolving, and for every cut you see in there, every cut has its own significant sound. Just by the rhythm of the cuts and the rhythm of the sounds, a moment becomes intense because of the rhythm cut together with the picture cuts, and that's something we really played around with here. Yeah. That is the dragging me into the screen like experience that I think this this film wanted. I also like how you said that there's always sound is always evolving. So mm -hmm. normally like if you see a drill and I'm editing like a scene, I'd be like, all right, I gotta go get a drill sound. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna drag it in. All right. It sounds good. It works. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to actually emotionally move the audience, there has to be some kind of progression. There has to be some kind of change throughout time. <laughs> And so the fact that you would choose to pitch up and escalate the sound and create more tension with it blows my mind. That's amazing. Now I had a little bit more of a practical question oh, that yeah. came to mind while you were just talking about your workflow with the editor. Mm -hmm. And so how did that work? Did he cut a scene and give it to you? Did he like what what was the workflow and how did you work with the picture editor? I started working on the sound. I mean. I think two weeks after they started picture editing or something, it was very, it was very, very early. As soon as they kind of had a first pass on the sequence, I, they sent it to me and I did a pass on the sound. It was a way of kind of like constantly going back and forth and um, inspiring each other. We had scenes that we were trying like, okay, so what happens if this sequence is told only through sound and there's no music? What happens in this sequence if we tried only music and no sound? I also experimented a lot with the sounds I put in there, like just to see, okay, so how can we kind of push the, the sonic identity of this film, like try out some things which hopefully people haven't experienced quite that way before mm. um, because we wanted to create something special. That's awesome. I feel like a lot of people were like, okay, the editor is going to edit, they're going to do their thing, they're going to put in temp sound, and they're going to send it to the sound designer, and that's it. But I love your workflow, how the editor gets to play with your stems, gets to move stuff around, adjust the scene as he's cutting, and you can play off each other creatively and really come up with the best of both worlds, you know? Shout out to Hannah Montana. But uh, <laughs> The thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the only sound that you're really using from the shoot is the dialogue. All the other sounds you hear, like every single sound, is something that's done afterwards. It's not just about how the scenes are portrayed visually, it's very much about what is the soundscape of each scene. What are the characters listening to? Mm. A lot of the characters are listening constantly, like to vinyl records. Sometimes they're listening to hearing music in the background. Sometimes they're just standing there listening to uh, sounds from above the roof or like things like that. There's a lot of sequences, which is really about the characters listening. Mm. And the thing is that when the characters are listening in a film, then the audience is listening. So this means that as a sound designer, then you really, it opens up for being very creative with the sound because it's so much about hearing things and what what the characters are hearing. The way you're describing it is you're making sure that the sound design really does feel like it's in the perspective of the characters. So how do you do that? How do you actually create a believable world that somebody can immerse themselves in? You're not just thinking about, like, how is something looking? When when two lovers meet at the restaurant and they have to 
tell each other that, oh my, I mean, the the relationship is falling apart. Is that going to be in a noisy restaurant with lots of loud sounds from the kitchen? And they have to talk really loud and say, I don't love you anymore. I cannot take this. Or is it going to be a very, very quiet restaurant with like no noises from the kitchen and they just sit there whispering, hmm. I don't love you anymore. I can't, I can't take this anymore. I mean, the more you think about those things as a director, like, where it's not just about what you see, it's also really about what you hear, and because of that, about what you feel, then the world that you create, the story that you tell, become more immersive. I also dabbled in sound design very loosely, and there was an instance last week where I did my own sound design, and I got it from a, a sound effects library, put it all in, it sounded great, but it still sounded like it was in a studio. Uh, as in, how do I, how, what would the process be of like, once you've got that design right, how do you make it sound like it's in that world? Sound libraries with a lot of sounds are sometimes made in a way so that they can kind of like be so neutral that they fit with every film out there. So mm. that like, if I have a car pass by in a comedy, I want it to sound like shaking and rattling, like... And if it's in a mm -hmm. horror film, it should sound scary. Like mm -hmm. in a lot of sound libraries, if you have, to, if you take the sound of a passing car, it's just like yep. they don't have much character. Often you kind of think like, okay, I should record the perfect sound. So now I, I try to make it very almost stereo and there shouldn't be any noises in the background. She just like have that little sound and it's often, be I mean, makes the sound less interesting. Mm. I think a lot of the interesting things about sound both comes from the sound having a little twist, but also recording it in a way where you actually also record the space around the sound. So it just feels yeah. more organic. Mm. It feels like it's part of an environment especially reverbs. I mean, mm. sometimes what we, what I do is also like if I layer something a lot on top of each other and have a very layered sound, then if I add the same reverb to every, every, every one of those sounds, then it feels like it's in the same space, even though mm. a specific sound might be 12 different sounds, but by giving them all the same kind of reverb, then it feels like it's in the same space and it comes from the same source. Why didn't I think of that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was such a yeah no yeah no that, that that is I think that that is that is the fix on that yeah. But what what about if it's like on an outside? Uh, let's just say in the middle of a field, like that would not create reverb. How could you make that sound uh, believable? That's actually often like as dry as possible because you don't want any reverb outside. It's like. It often feels fake to have a reverb outside, mm. so that that I would say you should record that as dry as possible. But then again, then that makes it even more important that the sound has a little special character. That if someone is walking in the field, then you hear a little creak of mm. like um, of of the dirt or the there's mud in there or like there's some grass that is like that has like. <laughs> I mean, all these tiny, mm. small sounds often make the sound more believable. There's one question I've, I've been kind of itching to ask as well with all of this. I think with Evil Dead, of course, the first one's being directed by Sam Raimi, who has been uh, like one of the biggest pioneers of horror in our generation in this. He is incredible with his sound design and his sound direction as well. This being part of that franchise is also a love letter to Sam Raimi as well. What was that even like for you to be creating that process and also I would even say being part of that love letter to Sam Raimi and what and how he has contributed towards the horror genre? I mean, that was amazing for me. I mean, as a teenager, I was a big, big fan of Evil Dead. Uh, well, I've been mm -hmm. that all my life, but I mean, for for back then, I had this VHS tape of Evil Dead 2 and I I saw the film so much that the tape itself crumbled. I mean, one of the first things that happened when I when I started working on the sound was that uh, Bruce Campbell 
who was executive producing this film together with Sam, he made sure that I got um, a hard drive with all the original sound effects from the first two movies uh, digitized. Oh, wow. So it was like you heard kind of like someone say, oh, uh, scream of terror, take one, beep. Scream of Terror, take two. And I was thinking, ah, oh, that's great. Um, but I mean, I'm, I was thinking like, okay, Bruce is going to like come around and be there for 10 minutes and then leave. And I think he was, I mean, he came in and he was there for like four hours talking about like every individual sound, like how it was made, how they recorded it. Sam and Bruce, and these are the sounds that I kind of grew up with. Like hearing the story behind them was amazing. So we selected um, a few different sounds from the 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 original Evil Dead movies that are now in the new one. Like for example, the in the very beginning of the film and at the very end of Evil Dead Rise, we have the sound of a fly. And that fly is also the very first sound you hear in the first Evil Dead movie. And it's, I mean, it's the exact same sound effect. Wow. So if you're really a hardcore Evil Dead audio fanatic, then you'll find quite a lot of funny, fun Easter eggs in the new film. I love that. There's, there's quite a few references put into the you film. I love that. I love that. That experience will make anyone extremely happy, especially just having Bruce Campbell in there. That's amazing. You're just such an inspiration to a lot of us. And so what would be one of your biggest pieces of advice for up and coming sound designers or even post-production um, workers? I mean, something that's amazing nowadays is that great sound equipment is getting so cheap. Getting uh, one of these small hard drive recorders to record sound is just great because when you record sounds, then one thing is that you like slowly you get a library of sound effects, but you also listen in a different way when you record sound. And then the other thing I would say was like, listen to your favorite films. Um, why is it that you love the, the movies that you love? And then sit down, watch them, but not maybe not watch them. Maybe try and switch off the image and then just listen to them and hear the sounds. So what is it you like about the sound of your favorite movies? How do they do, like, how do they build the sonic world in these movies? Like, what kind of things are they, I mean, what kind of tricks are they using? Then... Go crazy, be creative, and have fun 